Apes do have the right not to be driven to extinction. They have the right to have their environment protected. They have the right not to be put in cages and zoos. But if we're discussing human rights, absolutely not. Um, uh, because essentially, they're not human. I don't think anyone here would argue that uh, point. And therefore, I would say apes have rights, but not human rights. Thank you. We can distill the question further. The concept of rights only makes sense if they are relevant for the potential recipient. It makes no sense to talk about apes having the right to vote, for example, because they cannot exercise that right any more than people with <coughs> severe mental disabilities can. The primary right we are talking about, and I, I, don't, I don't characterize this as a human right, the primary right we're talking about with apes, with animals generally, is the right to protection from deliberate infliction of harm by human beings. So should humans desist from deliberately harming apes? Ethics is all about curtailing what we may want to do, what may be, even be to our advantage, because it is considered wrong to do it. And, it. and the reason it is considered wrong is it because it may significantly, our behavior may significantly harm a third party. That is the whole point of ethics. Behavior which cannot harm another falls outside the realms of ethics in my view, which is why I believe the term sexual morality is a misnomer if no one is potentially harmed by the act in question. Now there are regrettably innumerable ways in which humans harm apes and other animals, but let us focus on one of the most obvious and controversial experimentation. And let us focus on one type of experiment, those designed to find cures for serious human diseases. Animal experiments are carried out for many other purposes, often trivial, but it is with serious medical research that the ethical issues are most sharply joined. The first point to recognize is that, perhaps surprisingly, proponents and opponents of animal experiments share a great deal in common. We agree that finding cures to horrible diseases is of the first importance. None of us will go through life untouched by serious illness, whether to ourselves or to our loved ones. I yield to no one in my support for the NHS and the importance of research provided the research is humane. But secondly, we agree, I anticipate, that despite the overwhelming importance of the objective, there are limits on what should be done to, to achieve it. The vast majority of people would not experiment non-consensually on humans when it is not for the individual benefit of, the, of, of those humans. Despite the fact that that would indisputably, experimenting on people, would indisputably increase exponentially the chances of finding cures to human diseases, because humans are a much better model for human diseases than, than other animals. As a society, we say that experimenting on people is just wrong as unfair to the victim. We take a deontological approach, wrong in principle, irrespective of the benefit foregone. Most supporters of animal experiments, by contrast, employ an utilitarian approach, weighing the cost to the animal with the benefit to people, although some would not even trouble to put the cost, in, uh, cost of the animal into any ethical equation. So is there a relevant difference, and I stress relevant, between human and non-human animals when it comes to experimentation, or indeed any other form of exploitation? Now, clearly there is a difference. They belong to a different species. But why is that any more relevant in ethical terms than someone belonging to a different race, or a different religion, or gender, or supporting a different football team? The point is that apes, other animals, other sentient animals, share all the morally relevant characteristics. First, the capacity to suffer, uh, uh, sentiency. Second, an interest in not suffering when it is not for their individual benefit. And third, the desire for freedom to live one's life free of cruel exploitation. My belief is that empathy with the suffering of others lies at the heart of all ethics, not intelligence, or culture, or language skills, or tool making, or some other ethically irrelevant attribute. And that we should apply the golden rule found in every major, uh, every major religion, and even in secular systems of ethics such as uh, Confucius, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. We should strive to apply the golden rule to all those human and non-human sentient animals alike who are liable to suffer significantly as a result of our deliberate actions. In short, we should, in my view, <coughs> accord apes, sentient animals, generally, the right to protection 
from deliberate harm at the hands of people, which is simply another way of saying that as humans, we have a moral obligation to try not to cause significant harm, no matter who the victim. Thank you. I'm going to inject a little bit of science into the debate, um, uh, partly because I like science, and also because quite a lot of Great Apes campaigners also inject science, and particularly biology, into this debate. In the last three major attempts to have apes granted rights in New Zealand, Spain, and in Austria, biology has been invoked. Specifically, it's been argued that we humans are not an exceptional species. Humans and apes are biologically very close, that we're virtually genetically identical to chimpanzees, and there's no area of cognition that we do not share with them. So we're part of a continuum, apes with some little bit extra that make us human, or to put it another way, apes are, the nearly, per are nearly persons. Now to most of us, seeing a human and a chimpanzee side by side, it's blindingly obvious how different the two species are. However, because biology is regularly invoked to persuade us that apes are really persons, um, we should uh, look at the extent to which this argument pr from proximity holds water. Now with regard to genetics briefly, I'm sure you've all heard the mantra that humans and chimpanzees share over 98.5% of their genetic codes. So are we chimpanzees plus 1.5% of genetic sequence difference, chimps with a minuscule genetic tweak? Sadly not. The two genomes have only been sequenced and made available for comparison over the last five years, and yet already scientists have found a host of human-specific changes um, to the sequence and function of genes. One-seventh of all our genes have undergone evolution within the last 40,000 years, which means that culture drives the evolution of genes and vice versa. And it turns out that it's the when, where, and how hard genes work that's far more important than changes to the sequence structure of a gene itself. Uh, it's long been argued that chimps and the other great apes think like us. They, like us, understand something about other individuals' states of mind, allowing them, like us, to empathize or deceive. And they understand something intuitively, like us, about the natural forces of the world, which allows them, like us, to do things like design and use tools. But the best currently available scientific evidence casts great doubt on these claims. Uh, chimps may deceive each other without understanding why the trick works, and they may design tools by chance discovery. And a number of cognitive psychologists have recently concluded that humans are cognitively unique after all. The cognitive rift between us and other animals is actually monumental. You've only got to look at a couple of pictures. Here's a little picture which the ne people nearest to me can see. It's a picture of a chimp with a twig tool which he uses for extracting termites from their mounds. And here is a capsule humans invented off the cuff to, to extract over 30 miners from a hole in the ground 2,000 foot deep, while at the same time relaying live images of exactly what they're doing and how their success was going via advanced telecommunications using space satellites to invoke a wave of empathy from millions of humans right all over the globe. Now, I believe passionately in something that we should try to uh, our utmost to conserve apes and all other species on Earth, and we should try to eradicate cruelty towards them. But granting them rights, I believe, is the wrong way to go about it. It's an irrelevant distraction. The concept of rights makes no sense to me if you can't conceptualize what rights are fight to get them and maintain them, and understand that they form part of a contract which carries obligations to society. We understand all that, apes don't, and so no amount of rights we confer onto apes, or any other animal species for that matter, can amount to anything more than our protection of them, which can be achieved by other legislative means. Thank you. Jeremy has just said that um, he feels that apes should not have rights I think on three grounds, because there are three differences between humans and non-human apes. We are cognit cognitively different, although he didn't quite spell out what he meant by that. We can use television satellites, <laughs> and we can understand the concept of rights. Well, how many infants of a year old would have those qualities. Do we remove rights from Alzheimer's patients and from infants? 
If one species of ape has rights, then we all have rights. Human rights and ape rights are merely subsets of animal rights. I agree that the human species is extremely intelligent by the standards of our planet, but that doesn't give us special rights any more than professors or rocket scientists should have special rights. We're all equal before the law and morally, or are you arguing that very clever people should have special privileges. Speciesism is rather like racism or sexism, a prejudice based upon morally irrelevant differences. I believe that our concern for the pain and distress of others should be extended to any painient being, regardless of his or her sex, class, race, religion, nationality, or species. Painience is the only convincing basis for attributing rights or indeed interests to others. Of course, each species is different in its needs and in its reactions. What is painful for some is not necessarily so for others. So we can treat different species differently, but we should always treat equal suffering equally. In the case of non-humans, we see them mercilessly exploited in factory farms, in laboratories, and in the wild. <coughs> A whale may take 20 minutes to die after being harpooned. A lynx may suffer for a week in a leg hole trap with a broken leg. These are major abuses causing great suffering. Yet they're still justified on the grounds that these painions are not of the same species as ourselves. What a lame excuse. Would we justify the stoning to death of women in Iran on the grounds that they are just women? I hope not. Basically, it boils down to cold logic. If we're going to care about the suffering of other humans, then logically we should care about the suffering of non-humans too. It's the heartless exploiter of animals, not the animal protectionist, who is being irrational, showing a sentimental tendency to put his own species on a pedestal. They are elitists, speciesist snobs. We all, thank goodness, feel a natural spark of sympathy for the sufferings of others. We need to catch that spark and fan it into a fire of rational and universal compassion. Let us try to reduce suffering wherever it occurs and whoever, whoever suffers it. Should apes have rights? Now, a few of the speakers have said not in human terms, but the problem with that for me is that rights as a concept is a human concept. And the whole idea of rights, which is historically um, uh, quite recent, is premised on the idea of autonomous individuals who should be treated equally before the law. Um, and animals are not autonomous. They cannot take responsibility for their own actions. And they cannot subordinate their own individual biological drives to the interest of society as a whole. In fact, they don't have society. So I do think it's nonsensical to talk about rights for animals I think that we should always consider the interests of humans over and above those um, of animals, which is why I think animal research is morally right thing to do if it furthers medical advance and, and can further human knowledge. But that's not to say that I would advocate wanton destructiveness towards animals, taking pleasure, for instance, from hammering nails into the eyes of cats. To me, it, um, if anybody did that, that would be degrading to them as human uh, beings. It's an inhumane, uncivilized um, thing to do. But it's only important, I think, in terms of what it tells you about the human being. Since life began several billion years back, 99.999% of all species that ever existed have gone extinct. Uh, that's nature. Species come, species go. Uh, nature is amazing. It's created all kinds of weird and wonderful uh, species. But it is also, as uh, English poet Alfred Tennyson said, red in tooth and claw. I do think there's something unique about human beings. If human beings were to be wiped out, we would lose something really exceptional. We would lose culture and with that civilization. So we are a product of evolution like other animals. Um, I do recognize that, uh, Richard. But I do think in the, in the course of our history, something really amazing emerged and possibly came into effect 
give or take tens of thousands of years, possibly around 60,000 years ago, that transformed us, and that was our capacity for cultural transmission. So some kind of chance mutation or chance mutations allowed us at some point to start learning from each other in a qualitatively new way, and as a result of that, build on the achievements of our fellows and build on the achievements of previous generations. So for much of the six million years since our lineage diverged from our eight common ancestors, um, we remained little more than glorified chimpanzees for much of that time. But uh, approximately around 60,000 years ago, human history took off. And that, that's when we start seeing far more sophisticated tool making, uh, developed hunting techniques, even travel across, across oceans, cave drawings, and much, much more. And you know, this is as a result of being able to learn and build upon the clever inventions of our um, fellows, and has allowed us to start exerting some control over nature in the way that no other animal has. And culture, as a result, has taken off, and we've been able to uh, make life-changing inventions. We've built cities. Uh, we've invented the alphabet <coughs> and other forms of written symbol. We've produced art and literature. We can diagnose illnesses, and we can, uh, we can cure illnesses. We have a real sense of right and wrong, which differs in different historical periods, but we do at least have a sense of right and wrong. Animals don't have any kind of uh, morality. And we can debate and discuss, like, here at the Battle of Ideas, where we want to take society. Animals live in the here and now. Animals' lives are uh, hand to mouth. They may be social in the sense of operating in packs, but they do not learn from each other in the way that human beings do. They do not connect with each other in the way that human beings do. And that's what has made us so powerful, the fact that we can uh, connect with each other. We can truly imitate um, and not even the great apes can. Apes cannot ape. Um, human beings can imitate. It might not seem a very important thing, but I do think it's one of the key things, really, that has transformed us. We can learn from each other, and you can see human infants, even in their second year of life, can imitate with a high degree of flexibility. They can look at what the goals of the, of the person they're imitating uh, what their goal is, what their intention is, how they carry it out, the steps that they take in order to carry out the action that they're carrying out, and they can look at the end product. Apes, it seems, can only look at the outcome uh, and copy the outcome, but they have to invent their own way of getting there through trial and error, so, which is why I would argue that in the right <laughs> conditions, a really clever ape could invent all the ape behavior that we see today. It's absolutely impossible, however clever a human being is, that they could invent all the inventions and creations of human beings. Not even something as what might seem fairly simple as a bicycle um, uh, could a really clever human invent all by themselves without building upon the achievements of previous generations. They couldn't invent from scratch x-rays, combustion engines, harnessing of electricity. They couldn't write a beautiful poem. Um, and this is because our learning is cumulative, um, and we are able to build on the achievements of previous generations. This has led to culture, this has led to civilization, this has led to a unique connection that you do not find uh, in the uh, animal kingdom. So to conclude, I think human beings are unique because we have uh, created culture, um, and in that process we have made ourselves. So we are a unique species, and it would be a massive, massive loss if we were to be wiped out. Some people today argue that it wouldn't be. It's not a loss in and of itself if a species gets wiped out. That happens in nature. It might be a loss to some human beings, but in and of itself, it's not a loss. And I think if we lose sight of this, our unique capacities and what is unique about human beings, then I think we can lose sight of our capacity to improve our condition, human condition, uh, and develop humanity uh, further. So I would say our main challenge, and I know it's a challenge, I know it's a minority view viewpoint, but our main challenge is to uphold a human-centered uh, morality. The question did come up, well, wait a minute, we, we make the law, it's up to us, why can't we include animals? Well, we could include animals, but the, uh, the question is, how effective um, would giving animals rights, rights in the sense that they are actual legal rights, um, uh, recognised by the International Court of The Hague or whatever, 
Uh, and it can mean absolutely nothing in terms of the exercise of fairness or, uh, to those animals. We can protect these animals. We can set up all sorts of legislation. Um, if we wanted, we could prevent all animal experimentation through legislation. We can certainly set up uh, legislation to promote their conservation in Africa and other parts of the world where they're in danger. We don't actually have to get distracted by this, by this idea that we must give them rights and that that is the way to go forward and that is the appropriate way in which we design legislation for them. We should be considering uh, asking the question, are the other animals morally considerable? Are apes morally considerable just as other human beings are morally considerable? And just for the record, of course, both Peter Singer and myself have avoided using the concept of rights. It's always raised in debates like this because it's the word, the phrase animal rights that everybody knows about. But actually, technically speaking, neither Peter Singer nor myself, for example, and there are lots of others, um, don't really use the term rights. We, 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 we use uh, things like speciesism. Basically, what I think people have been saying is coming up with all sorts of different suggestions as to um, uh, qualities that human beings have that other species lack that put human beings into a special moral category. Um, our quality of pain is different. Well, yes, it is. Each species probably has different qualities of pain. The important thing is that we all experience pain of some sort. Uh, s somebody said the other animals don't go in for collaborative rescues like we saw um, in, in Chile recently. Well, of course, they haven't got the technology or the intelligence to do that, but um, in fact, you do see animals doing an awful lot of collaborative rescuing. There's been three examples recently on television. Um, <clears throat> one of a of e herd of elephants rescuing a baby elephant caught by his trunk by a crocodile. Um, the, a group of buffaloes uh, rescuing a baby buffalo from some uh, lions. All this has been filmed. Um, uh, and most interestingly of the lot, unfortunately it wasn't filmed, but there was lots of uh, witnesses there, of uh, dolphins rescuing human swimmers from shark attack. So <clears throat> there's all sorts of examples of, in their limited way, with their limited technology, and certainly lesser intelligence in general, other animals do show, happen to show those qualities. But they're really, it's still, even though they do that, it isn't re really morally relevant. Why should they be morally relevant? We've cited examples of individual human beings who, who don't have much in the way of uh, uh, judgment or civilization or, or, or uh, unselfishness? Do we uh, uh, withhold uh, morality from them? Do we not consider that they are morally considerable? No, it would be wrong to do that. So all I'm saying is that the important thing is not whether somebody has, um, not whether some individual has civilization or collaborative tendencies the question is, as Jeremy Bentham said years ago, it's not whether they've got four legs or whether they're intelligent. It, the question is, can they suffer? Well, I would say that's, that's morally irrelevant. Uh, nature is brutal, and there's a hell of a lot of suffering, not at the hands of human beings, but at uh, the hands of anim animals, at the hands of other animals. Um, and it's really morally irrelevant suffering. I mean, human beings suffer as well. Um, the key thing, I think, and I agree with you in, in terms of what you're saying, there's a problem with the, the rights discourse. Um, because, you know, things have, have been talked about in terms of right not to go extinct, right not to suffer, right to life. I mean, we don't have any of those rights. And I think rights really are a unique thing that's uh, is about viewing individuals as autonomous individuals equal before the law. And in that sense, children don't have rights either. You acquire rights once you become uh, an adult. So the question is, um, fundamental disagreement, I suppose, between um, uh, us is that I think you should always consider human interests over and above animal interests, because I do think as a species we are unique and as a species we have created something unique, culture and civilization, and that connection that we've got uh, uh, between each other. I mean, and it's not based on the cleverness of individuals. What we have, our uniqueness does not rest in the individual. It's nothing to, you know, it doesn't rest in um, uh, our brain capacity. It rests in that connection that happened as a result of some 
accident in our evolutionary past and came into force um, um, possibly about 60,000 years ago. I disagree profoundly with what Helene has just said, that suffering is, is, is not the morally relevant criteria. Surely suffering, the, the ability of those affected by our actions, that's the whole point of ethics. Th that is the key determinant of whether, whether, whether behaviour is, is ethical or not. If any moral argument that seeks to, to justify cruel behaviour is ultimately about selfishness. And I think as a human species, if we are special, and I, and I, and I accept that, that, that human beings, of course, are, are qualitatively different in terms of intelligence and culture and awareness and appreciating their history and collaborating and all those things, surely the, the, the conclusion from that is not that therefore we can cause pain and suffering to those who don't have those litany of, of, of abilities that we have, but quite the opposite, that we should demonstrate our, our, our uh, uh, extra morality, if you like, by, by uh, not doing the things which we, by, by force of our uh, strength and intelligence, can do. But suffering actually does not cut it as a criteria uh, for a fundamental right. Otherwise we'd be taking every lion that has hunted down an antelope to the Hague Court of Animal Rights or something for, you know, mass slaughter, speciesist, you know, basically genocide, I would say. You, know. you, you can see the ridiculousness of pretending that nature is not brutal, does not actually inflict pain on itself regardless of, uh, of care. Right? So it's important, but of course that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. I think the important thing is simply to understand that um, uh, the notion of uh, what we're talking about is wh whether we cannot simply use uh, other entities in our world as we see fit. The notion of right does not help us, uh, uh, the notion of pain and so on does not help us uh, establish that because it's not actually to do with our relationship to, us, to other species, it's to do with the relationship of how we see uh, our position in this world. And some of the comments have been very uh, indicative of a very low opinion uh, of what uh, we are and should be. Uh, in as much as we are destructive and so on. So really this discussion about uh, giving rights to other species uh, comes from a very kind of uh, substantial uh, anxiety about uh, whether we are capable of honouring uh, the meaning and the significance of the fact that we bestow rights to each other. I'm currently doing uh, work on mice and the experiments I'm doing do not produce these mice any pain or discomfort. They live very happy lives in the kind of enclosures with the right number of mice that mice like to live with. Um, they're then, <laughs> at some point, um, very painlessly um, anaesthetized and put down. And I think that you would still have a problem with those experiments, despite the fact that at no point in that time does uh, a mouse uh, suffer any pain. I'd be interested in hearing how you determine whether or not a species is painient. Um, does it have to do with can we empathize with pain that we witness or would you be willing to extend it to um, acknowledging that there's potentially something analogous to pain when, for instance, a plant releases a chemical cry when in adverse situations to alert its neighbors? As a, a clinician, I perform surgeries on patients and much of those surgeries are derived from my research on animals and I don't see that as an ethical issue with me. I'm, my life is dedicated to the humankind. I do not uh, survive to um, uh, operate on one less monkey if an experiment is promising. I do firmly believe that humans are an exceptional species. And I think that, um, that words like speciesism and painism are attempts to sort of um, strive to get a level playing field out of all this. We all feel pain. Uh, but even that runs into problems because I think um, if you're trying to compare the anticipation of pain, the memory of pain, and just thinking about the concept of pain between humans and an aardvark or something, then I think you know, you're, you're going to get into, into, into big problems. I really am mainly concerned about suffering. I mean, some of my colleagues, when, when I'm asked, wouldn't you agree with any experiments? And I say, yes. So, I mean, I've done the experiments myself, and, you know, as an experimental psychologist. Um, some of my colleagues in, 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 in um, <clears throat> America went to Cape Cod and tried to transmit telepathic messages to pods of whales. Now, that was an experiment. It was entirely scientific. But I don't think the whales suffered very much in the process. So I, I, I absolutely was, was all for those experiments. So you, you can take my, my assurance that really I am only interested 
in, in, the, in the issue of suffering. A number of people said, we really are a very exceptional species. Human beings are unique. Yes, we are. In a sense, that gives us a greater responsibility to be more uh, considerate in our treatment of the other species. Am I just looking for an excuse to um, find way um, to justify um, driving any uh, species to extinction? I don't think human beings have got any interest in driving any species to extinction. Um, if you think about hunting, we wouldn't have any interest in driving them to extinction because we don't carry on hunting. There may be certain cases where animals are a threat to human beings, and it is the case, isn't it, that in uh, the UK, wolves, they won't, weren't driven to extinction because they still exist elsewhere, but they were driven out of the UK. And I do think there's something slightly unsavoury about our, us getting on our high horse about other countries, and it always tends to be countries like India, for instance, where they're driving tigers to extinction, when those tigers are threatening and killing villagers. Um, and so if they want to protect themselves and go and uh, kill those tigers, and it may end up that those tigers go extinct, I'm not sure that I would have any uh, sleepless nights about that as long as um, you know, human lives were saved in the uh, process. We are far from perfect uh, uh, human beings as individuals and as a society, but we have something unique, which is a capacity to reflect on our shortcomings and learn from our mistakes and to actually debate and discuss what kind of society we would like to have and to fight for that. And I think we need to hold on to that, otherwise um, we lose the capacity to actually change things for the better. Just as we, as a, as a, as a species, have moved uh, against slavery to give rights to, to women and other oppressed groups, the, the, the move to protect animals from, I repeat again, the single important right of not being deliberately harmed by human beings, I see that as as, as a positive sign of how humanity can improve, not as a step of human beings somehow not, not having confidence in, in, in themselves. Thank you.